Um, there's a few people coming in. Um, thank you for all being here. Um, and the guy I really want to thank is Alex, the guy who organises this. I don't know where he is, but he should be pointed out because he's really special what he's been doing and the way he's developed this and taken this on. This conference is amazing. This is bigger than what we get in London for data science. It's really incredible. So I think that Alex, if I can grab him again, everybody should uh, give him big praise. So I'm going to tell you about um, the Open Compute Project and open source hardware. Um, I have an ambition at the beginning of all my presentations that everybody should leave the room learning one new thing. So let me ask some questions. And if I can get a zero hands, then I just have to give you one answer and then I know I've succeeded and then I can go home without doing any more. But who has ever seen an open source server, an OCP server? Has anybody ever seen one? Fantastic. So you're all going to learn something new today. It will be in the presentation. Right, so great. Now, the first thing you need to do is to read some books. These books. Now, one of the presenters, the guy who was doing the uh, AI on the music, um, wherever he is, he might be in the room, he kept talking about mindset. Look, the technology, this technology I'm talking about is mature, open source hardware. It's used in all the hyperscalers. This hardware is now being adopted in all of the world's telecommunications uh, infrastructures. It's the foundation for 5G infrastructures. You just don't, you haven't seen it yet. You just haven't seen it. But when it appears, it's very, very different to the technology that you're used to. A computer looks very different to a computer that you're physically used to seeing. And you need to understand habit. You need to understand habits. Because if you're going to make the most of it, in fact, there's our man there who did the music earlier. Fantastic uh, presentation, loved it. You've got to break out of these old ways. You have to change that intuitive mindset. And if you can change the intuitive mindset, and what's great about this room, there's lots and lots of young people in here, and they're not so fixed in their ways yet. We have a problem in Europe. The, this technology is growing so fast. A five-fold increase in revenues just in the next two years in Europe. And the traditional data center industry is falling away at 10% per annum because it can't compete with these technologies. But we can't get people to jump from the old to the new. They just won't come across. So what we're doing, we're developing all new businesses. And what I hope to do is we get some new businesses starting here to implement these technologies in this region as well. And there's another thing I'm looking for. One thing we have a big problem of is we don't have enough skills. And I'm looking to tie up opportunities with people in the academic and research establishments in this region, because we are very generous in this foundation of donating equipment for nothing. Like we did a research project in Sweden recently, we gave two and a half thousand computers to them for nothing. Now that's, it. that's more than building the data center. So it's a huge organization. You've never heard of it before, but you, you'll hopefully, this is the first time we've ever come to this region and it will take off, I'm sure. But you have to change that habit first. Now, open source hardware manufacturing, it, it, it's the future. The, the Danes uh, see this as the future of hardware manufacturing. Now, I can't spend an hour just talking about how it works. Go to that website afterwards. Hopefully, all these slides come out and you get the PowerPoint version of the slides because there's embedded videos. There's loads of slides at the end of this to help with more knowledge. Go to here, there's loads of videos and it'll show you what it's all about. Now, it's big. There are patents on Tesla cars, but they're all open patents. If you wanted to, you could make a, a Tesla car in your bedroom. You'll find this, all these disruptive technologies have got this underlying open source behind them. Wherever open source enters a market, it very, very quickly grows to dominate that market. So if you look at the Linux Foundation, which started in 2000, go in any computer center around the world and just average out how many computers are using the Linux operating system. It's like 98%. It's a huge success story. And what's interesting, 
Open source hardware is following a similar trajectory 10 years later. So by about 2026, 80% of all the computers in the world will be open sourced. Who believed that? Anybody? Okay. This is what I mean, you've got to change your mindsets. Um, so it's a community that started in 2011, and I'm going to just quickly show you a little video, if we can. This is a one and a half minute video, and our friend here is going to run it. And how do you get involved? Let's rewind. In 2009, a few engineers, hey guys, at a company, Hey, Facebook, realized in order to accommodate their huge influx of data, they'd have to rethink their infrastructure. So they set out to build the world's most efficient data center, and they did. But it got them thinking, if open source collaboration could create a software revolution, couldn't it do the same for hardware? So Facebook shared their knowledge with the world, and with the help of Intel, Microsoft, Rackspace, Goldman Sachs, and Andy Bechtelsheim, the Open Compute Project was born. Today, OCP is a thriving global community with hundreds of member companies and thousands of engineers collaborating to break open the black box of proprietary IT infrastructure to achieve greater choice, customization, and cost savings. Our project communities are led by volunteer leaders and overseen by our incubation committee to guide initiatives in data center facility, hardware management, high performance computing, networking, open system firmware, rack and power, security, server, storage, and telco. The result, member organizations and solution providers collaborating to create embedded software, firmware, hardware, and facility guidelines based on OCP's tenets of efficiency, scale, openness, and impact. Improving the efficiency of data flowing from the edge to the cloud worldwide. So can open source collaboration create a hardware revolution? It already is. Join us at opencompute.org. Who uses the Azure cloud? Who uses Facebook? You're all daily users of open compute technologies because what's behind them is this open source hardware. In fact, I had a very interesting little chat with the guys over here from Denmark. They've just opened a huge hyperscale data center in a dense. And I said, do you know what's inside it? And they've got no idea. And most people have got no idea what's inside these hyperscale data centers. Well, what's inside it is open source hardware. And it's profoundly better than conventional enterprise hardware. And I'll show you a few uh, things. Now, I'm going to do a little bit about machine learning and acceleration modules, which is a whole new uh, family of hardware towards the end of this. The hyperscalers got fed up with Dell and HP. They didn't want to be using general purpose computers in data centers, fundamentally a desktop PC that someone turned into a server. So they designed their own equipment. They recruited design engineers from Dell, etc., and they just went over to the Far East and designed their own computers. And the first computer they ever designed was called the Freedom Computer. It was Freedom from Dell and HP and the, the other big vendors. Now, what happened in 2016? So that's all the hyperscalers. 2016, the telcos started to adopt this technology to build out telecommunications infrastructures. Now, this is huge. This is the most rapidly growing element today in this technology. Every single one of the world's telephone exchanges is being turned into an open source data center. The build out for the 5G is based on open source. The gigabit passive optical networks that you're going to get in the street with the fiber connections to the houses and the offices is built on open source. We started inside the data center, but it's just gone crazy. Open source Wi-Fi. It's mind boggling. And the costs are just so dramatically lower. You'll see. Enterprises as well. Now, this is a, a traditional server that you might see in an enterprise data center. So there it is. You're looking at the back. There's a question for you. Why do we have all the cables on the back of the server? The reason we have all the cables on the back of the server is because that server started life as a desktop PC. 
And then when there was too many desktop PCs on the desk, someone said, if we pick them up and put them in a rack, we can clear the space for our, where we sit. And that's what happened. So that's why it's all on the back. Now, what the open compute community started to do back in 2009, they said, this is crazy. We don't want a desktop PC, we want a server. We want a, we want a CPU, we want some RAM, we want some storage, we want some network. We don't want all this other stuff. So they started stripping it down and they just did value engineering. And this is how it happened. And I'll strip out what we don't have. So there's no AC to DC power supplies in the servers. Gone, finished. There's no AC inputs on them. There's no out-of-bound management. The out-of-bound management, the way we do it, we take the out-of-bound management that's normally done with ethernet switches and these very expensive uh, power strips with intelligence in them, which might cost you £4,000 worth of management inside a, a faulty server rack, and we do it on a Raspberry Pi for $25. It's profoundly different, and it's just people playing with open source technologies, and it's transformed the world. And the reason you can do today so much on your software with your, your big data science is because of the hardware behind it that's getting so cheap and so powerful. No KVM, no, no keyboard, video or mouse. So it, basically it's that. It's just, it's a different shaped server. It's got an ethernet port on the back. You just push it into a rack and it clips onto a direct current buzz bar at the front. You never go to the back of the rack anymore. It's finished, don't go to the back of the rack. And this is what it looks like. So none of you had seen one before, so you've all learned one thing today. This is what's called an OCP cubby server. So they, those guys over there from Denmark, this is where there's like 100,000 of those in that data center in Odense. And this is what it looks like from the top. So this is the front of it. These are the CPUs just here. Look how clean it looks. And at the back, you've got two big fans and there's a DC clip on the back for the direct current. You just push it in, click, put one cable on the front, job done. No video cards. That computer uses half the amount of energy of a traditional server. Now, when you're talking about 100,000 servers, the, you know, the big cloud players have got millions of servers. Facebook probably has about 100,000 racks, just racks. And in a single rack, using that kind of server there, it's this one that's been upgraded to this. There's one server here, but there's four servers in this one. It's called a Yosemite. So in one rack, we can get nearly 200 servers now. And all we do, we don't use any telescopic rails. There's no ball bearings anymore. Everything's stripped out. It's just so simple. And what's clever about it, you notice all these green bits called green touch points. The green touch points, because it's toolless, there's no tools. And all you want to do is, when you're going to work on it, I've never ever read a manual for one of these, but I can change any component in about 180 seconds. I can change 80% of all the components in 60 seconds. And all you have to do is do the green touch point. Now, this is just a little bit about why they're energy efficient. That's a pizza box traditional server. This is an OCP server. It's got big fans instead of small fans. If you reduce the speed of a fan by 50%, you reduce the energy to spin it by seven eighths. So why did we ever go down to these squash servers? They're just not energy efficient. Just change the shape and that's all we've done. Now I'm going to rip down. This is a 40 server traditional rack and I'm just going to rip stuff out of it. Those little uh, orange things have, have just gone. They're all those tiny fans taken out hundreds. These are all the AC to DC power supplies, taking them all out. Those blue things at the top are the top of rack switches. I do my out-of-bound management differently. Now I use a $25 Raspberry Pi. I don't use a $1,000 Ethernet switch. These green things at the back are $1,000 each, and they're called intelligent power strips. And there's four of them in there and I'm taking them out and I'm throwing away $4,000 worth of gear. You throw away the downflow crack units. We don't use downflow crack units. 
These servers can take temperatures on the front of 65 degrees centigrade on the front, so we don't need any air conditioning. That has a huge impact on the build of the data center. We don't have access floors. Throw them away. You can put it in an access floor, but you throw it away. Now, I've just thrown away all that cable spaghetti in the back. That's roughly, depending on how it was configured, somewhere between $10,000 to $16,000 per rack. All right? Now, let's see what it does to the data center facility. That's the traditional development. We've been improving, but what happened was this invisible thing happened. And the energy efficiencies on these systems is so dramatic. There's a traditional data center. What I'm going to do, I'm going to rip it down, taking out all the mechanical chilling. We take out all the centralized UPS. And that's an OCP, optimized data center. You can see the IT gear up there. And what we do, now we've got lithium ion batteries, we can embed the lithium ion inside the racks. So that's the UPS function. Okay. Now, just to get your head around this, some of the numbers, an OCP optimized data center is at least half the price of a traditional tier three enterprise data center. Now, if you want to put that into perspective in terms of numbers, a traditional tier three data center, it's a redundancy uh, element. Most uh, enterprise data centers are what we call tier three in terms of availability. It will cost you about 8 million euros per megawatt. Now, a megawatt is roughly a data center, the equivalent of something with 205 kilowatt racks in. So if it's 8 million and you divide that by 200, the overhead, just to put the cabinet in the space, is 40,000 euros or dollars per rack. So just to build the building, put in all the plumbing, put in all the UPS, all the chilling, all the access floors. That's, that's the overhead on the building. So if you can build the building half the price, you save $20,000 just put in the rack here before you put any IT gear in. Now, that's what we used to do, 50%, but we've just built these new wooden data centers in Scandinavia, and they're 75% cheaper. So the overhead per footprint is just $10,000. So I've saved $30,000. And I've not even got to the IT yet. I'm just talking about the building. Now, what's interesting, there's a whole new circular economy on all this hardware coming out. So Facebook doesn't throw away its servers. They're all repurposed and reused. And you can actually get a rack full of IT equipment for about $30,000. So today, you can build an OCP optimized data center with all the IT gear in for the same price as just building the building traditionally. It really is radical. Now, I'm going to talk to you about these uh, accelerator modules. These are some of the companies involved in it. Has anybody heard of that company called Inspur? See it in the middle? Yeah? Notice you, you'll find uh, some of those companies that you know and love are not there. Like, where's, uh, where's Dell? Where's HP? Now, they're members of the organization, but they don't do anything in the organization. They're all members. Um, when I started about four years ago, we had 88 members. Uh, now I think we're at about 300. Inspur is the third largest manufacturer in the world of computers. There's another one in there. See that one down there, QCT? They probably make around about 40% of all the world's laptops. Nobody's ever heard of them. It's really interesting what's happened. Now, what these are, these are the new accelerator modules. We call them open accelerator modules. And what's really good, these prosumers, these consumers of the technology are driving the open standards. Now, they're all from different manufacturers, Intel, AMD, NVIDIA, but they've all got the same socket. So that hassle that you used to have where you've got an Intel processor on a motherboard, if you wanted to change the processor, you change the motherboard. You don't have to anymore. We've changed the whole 
equation. And this is one, what we call universal baseboard. So this takes eight of those accelerator modules and all the manufacturers make the processors to go into the universal baseboard so we can mix it. We don't have to keep throwing everything away. Just to give you an idea on the scale of the power of these things, each one of those modules I showed you on the other side can go up to 700 watts. So that is a 5.6 kilowatt server. And the power in it to do your, your data science is huge. Just to give you a perspective, this technology accelerates your training process by 300 fold. That's how much it speeds it up. So when years ago you used to do your training and you'd be sitting there for like 30 hours waiting for something to train up, now you can just do it in a few hours or less. Really dramatic. These are some of the uh, accelerator computers. Here you can see them from different manufacturers, but they're all open. Now, what we also did through this research project in Sweden, we developed this world's efficient, most data center, most energy efficient, but we also did a few other things. We, we started to use machine learning. So this is the world's most efficient air-cooled data center. It, it's quite amazing. Um, it's got the lowest carbon footprint. It's made of wood, so it's virtually neutral. I see this as the future for data centers. And you guys have lots of wood around here, so it'd be ideal for you people. You, you don't have to import concrete, which is high embedded carbon. You can make your data centers out of wood. Now, how can we make the data center more efficient? So every single system has a sweet pot spot of efficiency. And if you can find that sweet spot and make it work at that load, you get efficiency. So what we did, we profiled these servers we did these energy profiles, and then we run these machine learning algorithms on top. Now, typically, your server loads, your virtualized server loads, will go all across the hardware. And then we ran the machine learning, and what it does, it optimizes in the sweet spot of efficiency on the hardware. And as a result, it reduced the amount of energy consumed by 20%. Now, that was the first hit. They believe they can go to 40 or 50%. So this is where you people can come in and start working in our community. Because we're a dirty community. We use lots of energy. Those data centers in Denmark are 300 megawatt data centers. Google did it as well. They got a 40% reduction just by running machine learning on all the cooling systems, on all the world's data centers that they have. And it's huge. And that's it. And I've got six minutes left if anybody wants any questions. Okay. We have a number of, we have a number of questions, quite interesting ones. How can something be open compute with HP, Intel, and other big companies can't relate with open source software? And I can follow with a question, what is open source here? Yeah, what is open source? Now, inside these computers, you've got microprocessors, which are full of intellectual property. So there is an elephant in the room, but we're not quite there yet. It's not kind of the ideal perfect as, uh, it's not quite perfect, but we're moving. And I don't know whether you're aware, you know I showed you these processors here and how we're standardizing the sockets. Are you aware that there's a European, it's part of the European Union, but it's called the Open Processor Project, and it's called RISC-V? You familiar with that? Now, what's happening is that proprietary nature of the kind of the processors is being open sourced. So we're gradually eating away at the world with open source. But it's not pure at the moment, if that answers. Okay, well, I don't know. <laughs> uh, how do you deal with the... ARM processor architecture of Raspberries. Software has to be explicitly compiled to the ARM architecture. Also, over time, they simply burn out. Well, it's an interesting one because you think it's not a very reliable machine. All we do, we create a little virtual Linux container and we drop it onto the, uh, the Raspberry Pi. 
And within it, we have a little bit of open source software called, um, uh, I can't remember what it's called now, but it controls everything in the rack. And you can download it off of GitHub. It's just this piece of software. Now, they are unreliable. But we don't care. Because when you start using lightweight virtualization, using Linux containers and Kubernetes, and you start moving stuff around, especially when we start getting machine learning, I don't give a damn about a server going down. I don't care if I lose my management in a rack. And there's a wonderful, if you ever, anybody a fan of XKCD, the, the cartoonist, yeah? If you have a look, he's done a wonderful one. It's about not even worrying about the whole data center failing. And then there's this conversation going on and someone says, well, if it burns down, we rope it off. And then we just go somewhere else. And they, someone at the end says, is that rope really necessary? And that's the approach. We don't care about hardware failures anymore. That's why we don't talk about tier three redundancies. We don't have hardware redundancy in the same way because the software integrates with the hardware. And when that server starts to die, that container goes somewhere else. So we don't care. We'll end you, I like this one. We'll end user pay less for services and equipment with all those improvements in hardware. Who benefits at the end? It is cheaper. Um, there's, when you move it, look, all the cloud players use this technology. This is, they do. But there is something that's quite interesting. As you scale your operations, let's take um, Dropbox. Dropbox scaled storage in the Amazon cloud. When you get to a certain size, certain physical scale for your solution, it's cost effective to bring it back into your own space. So that's what Dropbox did. They pulled away and they're involved with this community and they have their own infrastructure now. In the early days, when you're doing development, you can't beat just getting on the cloud, using these processes and doing your machine learning. But when you, if you're gonna really scale, and I don't think anybody's really doing large scale kind of number crunch in here, um, often you'll find when you get to that certain level, it's cost effective to have your own, generally. Who actually produces the hardware? Companies you've never heard of. Like these two. Inspur, QCT, WeWin. Uh, has anybody heard of a company called uh, Acton? Acton's a really interesting company. It's a Taiwanese company. And what's interesting about them, they got involved with this community around about, it was a few years before I got involved, so about two, might have been about 2014. And they make Ethernet switches. And what's interesting, when they got involved with the community, ever since they got involved in 2014, their turnover has doubled every single year, year on year on year. And now they're a multi-billion pound business. And nobody's ever heard of them. There was a research study that was done just last month. 55% of all the world's ethernet switches now are open switches. But you don't see them because a lot of them go into these spaces. You'll hear this term white box switches. They're open switches. So yes. What percentage of all world service is open source now by your opinion? When will it be more than, when will it prevail? I can, give you, I can give you it in terms of numbers. If you counted all the computers coming out of manufacturing next year, so all these servers coming out of the manufacturing out of these Inspur, WeWins, um, MyTAC, just go on the OCP website and look at the community members. You'll see all these manufacturers. Next year, we're probably one third of all the servers coming out of factories next year will be OCP. We're over 50% on all the switches this year. So it's actually running ahead of, uh, of, of the, uh, the situation. Finally, how do you make money? <laughs> Business model. This is really interesting. How do you make money in open source? And this is why a lot of people don't jump. But I'll tell you a little story about the people who started this organization back in 2011. And it was this. Every single one of them today is a multimillionaire. And one of them is so rich, he's a venture capitalist in California. Now, it's so easy to make money. If you have an offer, and it was good listening to that, how you make money on open data conversation, because everybody was focused on sustainable business. You have to get the economics right. Now, if you are coming in at such a low price, 
low cost compared to the traditional industry, here's the magic. You've got traditional industry players playing with each other in a really competitive market, making really low gross profit margins. If you come in and you can do it much, much lower cost, you don't have to make 10% gross profit margins. You can make 30 or 50% gross profit margins. You don't have to, until the competition comes in and then you've got to be more competitive again. So you can make a lot of money at it. And that example of Acton, it's just mind boggling what's happening. And there's lots of opportunities in this technology. So thank you very much. Okay. Wait a second. Oh, okay. So, has, has anybody learned anything new from John's <laughs> presentation? Can I see the hands? Oh, fantastic. Wow. Can I take a picture of everybody learning something yeah, new? Yeah, yeah, please, please, please. Hang so, on, hang on. Wait a second. And can you all go like that? Like, and, and I'll say uh, Tottenham oh, Football. No. I'll say Tottenham Football Club, and then you can put your hands down. Right. I, I, all, all put your hands up and I'll take a picture because it's really get you blokes on the internet. Fantastic. Well done. I hope you enjoyed Okay, it. so now we can present you with a oh, certificate. Thanks. Here's the certificate for John. Thank you very much. Thank you, John.